Welcome to Sisters in Crime Australia and Murder Monday, when authors talk about their crime craft. I'm Karina Kilmore, a debut crime writer, a journalist, and a national convener for Sisters in Crime. And we've been celebrating women's crime writing since 1991. Before I introduce crime writer Pamela Hart, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past and present. Pamela, welcome. Thanks, Karina. It's lovely to be here. Lovely to have you. You've got loads of writing experience across several genres and under mm -hmm. your author name, Pamela Freeman, you're well known for your adult fantasy novels, the Castings Trilogy, and your Aurealis award-winning novel, Ember and Ash. And more recently... And of course, I write for children as Pamela Freeman as well. Great. Thank you, Pamela. And more recently, you've been writing historical romance novels under your author name, Pamela Hart, including mm. the internationally lauded The War Bride, and as well as your own writing, you also teach at the Australian Writers' Centre, where you, where you are Director of Creative Writing. But at Sisters in Crime, we are especially thrilled that you've recently taken up a life of crime. I with, have. <laughs> with your debut crime novel, Digging Up Dirt. So before we get to the questions, can you please give us the elevator pitch for Digging Up Dirt? Well, the tagline is renovations are hell and that's before you find the body beneath the floorboards. Um, and that gives you a sense of the kind of book it is. Poppy McGowan's my main character um, and it is the first of a series. So it'll be the Poppy McGowan mysteries. And um, she's a TV researcher for the ABC kids and um, she's renovating her little house and her builder finds bones under the floor. Um, they're not sure if they're human or not. So she calls in, she used to work at the Museum of New South Wales. She calls in some archaeologists from there to find out if they're human or animal. And one of those archaeologists is her past enemy, Julianne Weaver. And when Julianne's body is found in Poppy's house, um, she has to uh, deal with the after effects of murder. Um, and, uh, and we have a mystery. I guess is what happens then, you know. So um, it's, a, it's a book that deals with a lot of aspects of Sydney life, um, including right-wing religions and political parties and uh, the museum and um, quite a few red herrings, obviously, because that's what we like to do in a mystery story. Yeah, great. Sounds fantastic. Okay, let's get to our questions. We'll have a little shuffle and off we go. How important is place in your writing? Oh, well, it's a real, it is a Sydney book. It's an Australian book. Um, you know, I, I think uh, Australian cosies are a bit different from other, other cosies. They're a bit tougher, you know, a bit, people swear, you know, they have sex. Not only the bad people have sex. Um, and, uh, but Sydney as a place, I deliberately set out to, to use Sydney as a character, to have, um, we see a lot of Sydney. We see, you know, the northwest and the beaches, and uh, and and obviously Annandale, where the book is set. Um, so there is really a sense of um, Poppy's own love for the city, um, but also, um, yeah, just a just a whole lot of um, of Sydneyness. So place is really very important to me. I think. Right. What started you on a life of crime? <laughs> I had been writing historical novels as Pamela Hart. Um, not all of those are romances, but, but some of them definitely are. And um, I had to do a lot of research for those. And they're set in World War I. Four out of the five are set in World War I. The, the last one, the Charleston scandal, is 1920s London. But I, I had come out of writing The Desert Nurse, which um, is about a nurse who dealt with the fallout from Gallipoli. And it's not a grim book, but the research was quite grim, quite uh, confronting. How do you amputate a leg in a 
field hospital in, in Palestine in 1917. You know, it, it was quite confronting some of it. And I came out of that going, I just, I just want to write something that has no research at all, like none. And a friend of mine said, well, you've always wanted to write a mystery story, write a mystery story, you know. And so um, that's, that's what happened. And so I just started writing and I really just wanted to write something that was fun, both for the for me to write it, but also for the reader. What's the scariest thing in your novel? Pentecostal Christians. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I, yeah, I think I think uh, zealots are the, are the scariest thing in it you know because I think uh, fanatics of any kind are dangerous um so yeah that's I think that's what I would say yeah there's not a lot of graphic violence um you know there's no violence on the page which is what you need for 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 this sort of lightheartedness um so yeah I would think that's it zealotry do women write different stories to men depends on the woman you know, I'm not a big fan of that kind of generalization, but I think um, I think women are less likely to have female characters be sexy lampposts. Um, I don't know if you know that that phrase, but the idea is if you could replace the character with a sexy lamppost, then um, the, in that they're just standing there looking good and admiring the hero. I think women tend not to write sexy lamppost characters, and I also think. Um, they tend to write a greater range of ages, I've noticed, of women. Um, and, uh, and there are some male writers who do that brilliantly also, but I do find that male writers tend to write uh, a, narrower, a narrower group of women than women do. How do you write about violence? I write very carefully about violence because I don't want it to be, um, I, I don't want it to be kind of sexy, you know, it's like, um, uh, and I, you know, in, this is in all my books, it's not just in the crime novels. Um, and I think you have to be very careful not to make violence alluring in any way. Mm. Um, both for the comfort of the reader, but more generally, culturally, I think it's, you know, we have enough of that. Yeah. Are you a plotter or a pantser? Now your students will be interested in this. Yeah, well, it's an interesting thing. I think it, it, it changes with every book. Mm -hmm. I, and I think this is one of the problems with people going, well, I'm a plotter, I'm a pantser, is that when their version of what they do isn't working for them, they're lost. But if you go into it thinking, well, every book is different, maybe I'll plot this one, maybe I'll pants the next one, it, it's much easier for you to find a way through when things start to go wrong. So uh, for my historical novels, most of them were quite heavily plotted because I had to do the research um, and also because I sold them on a proposal and you have to write an outline for a proposal. So um, for this one, I was writing it on spec and I just started writing and I had no idea who the murderer was like none, just made it up as I went along. And then once I had my first draft and I knew who the murderer was, then I went back and I put the clues in, which weren't there at all, um, and put some more red herrings and stuff like that. So um, for these books, so I've just, I'm doing a structural edit on the second poppy book um, and they are absolutely pantsed because I don't really want to know who the killer is before I, before I get to that part. But other books have been completely plotted, so who knows. When and how do you work out plot twists and red herrings? You've almost answered that. <laughs> yeah, look, I obviously often on a walk, you know, I'll get to a bit where I don't know what happens next um, for these books and I'll go, often the question is what's the worst thing that can happen? You do that, you know. Um, but sometimes I think, well, how can I confuse people more? And quite often going for a walk and I'll come back and I'll have the idea um, or sleep on it and you wake up at three o'clock in the morning, aha, now I get it. Now I know what was to happen, you know. Um, but um, I often just hand it over to the unconscious and let, let it sort it out. It always knows more than I do. How do you write about humour? 
<laughs> uh, um, look, I'm doing this because my publisher has just sent me the book back going, uh, it's not as funny as the first one. Can you make it funnier? <laughs> and, um, and I would if I knew how, you know. Uh, I think for me, humour just comes out of the characters. It, it just comes out of the character in the situation. Um, and in fact, what I'm doing to make it funnier is I'm putting an entirely new character in the book. Um, the issue I have with the second book is that it's about quite a serious thing, like a, quite a fragile person gets hurt. And you can't make fun of any of that strand of the story. Uh, and so I've put in a comic character in a, another strand of the story so that we can have more lightness in that part without devaluing the seriousness of what happened to the character in the other section. Yeah. So I think it's all about character in the end. What research did you do for your latest novel? None. I did none. <laughs> Look, I cheated. I gave her my old job at the ABC. I gave her my old little house in Annandale that I did renovate. I gave her my friends. You know, I rang up my friends saying, you want to be in the book? Yeah, put me in the book, you know. Um, uh, so I I really didn't do any for that. Um, I for, for subsequent poppy books, I will be doing more research. Um, the third or fourth one, we're not quite sure yet because we're not sure when the dig's going to go ahead, but it will be set on an archaeological dig. Right. Um, so um, it's supposed to be happening in January, but it might, because of COVID, it might be delayed a year. Um, but, you know, obviously I'll be doing serious on, on the ground research there yeah. uh, about how things work. Um, so, yeah, it varies from book to book. It can be a lot of, uh, obviously, the historical things is all. It's all research, but for these, none. No research for digging up dirt. Just fun. What What is your top writing tip and your top self-editing tip? Okay. Um, my top writing tip is from Pat Walsh. The number one reason your book won't be published is that you haven't written it. Uh, so the corollary to that is just keep writing. Don't go back and try and edit the beginning to get it right. You cannot, and this is particularly true with crime, more true of crime than any other, other genre. You cannot fix the beginning until you know what happens at the end. And the book will change on you as you're writing it and new things will come up and new characters will come in and new ideas will hit you. And you can't get the beginning right until you've written the end. So don't even try. I think people often feel like, oh, it's got to be right before I can write the next chapter. No, you'll never finish that way. Just keep writing. Right. Um, and the top tip for self-editing is be prepared to throw stuff out. So my last historical novel, over a number of drafts, I threw out a total of 70,000 words. Wow. And it's very freeing. <laughs> when you know you can do that, it's like, yes, I don't need that scene. I can take this character out, you know, or I will put in a whole new idea here. And if you if you approach it with that idea of you're still playing with the story, um, that it's not quite as serious as you think it is, you're still playing with ideas, you can still be radical in what goes into the book. I think it's both more enjoyable to edit, but also you're more likely to do a good job. Terrific. How much of a profile do you do for each character before you write? None. <laughs> <laughs> that probably gives you the wrong impression. I, I think about them a lot. So I don't write them down. What I The only kind of Bibles I write are about, uh, like, relatives, who's married to whom and how old the nieces and nephews are and that kind of stuff. Um, but actual character profiles, no. Um, and this is true for all my writing. You know, uh, I'm I'm not a good model for anybody, frankly. Um, but I do think about them a lot, and I might have thought about them for quite a long time before I put them on the page. Um, so I, yeah, I do feel like. Um, I mean, one of my mottos with my students is there's no right way. You know, there's only the way that works for you. 
And for me, I've tried writing the character profiles and I just go, oh, for God's sake, I'll just try the right story. And, um, but I do do a lot of character development. I just don't write it down. What's the hardest thing about writing a novel? Uh, drafts, draft after draft after draft after draft. And the point, you will always get to the point where you think this is crap. You know, no one is ever going to want to read it. It's not original. Um, it's it's boring. It's And particularly with this kind of book, it's like it's too obvious. Everybody is going to see who it is. Clearly, you know, they're going to guess, but you forget that they don't know all the stuff that you know. Um, and so I have learned that there is always that moment. There's always that moment where you think this is a terrible book and this is what you need your beta readers for. You know, when you get to that point, it's really important to give it to somebody else to read so that they can come back to you. And it, it's never as bad as you think it is. But also they can come back to you and go, yep, this is fantastic, but this bit would be better if, if you changed it, you know. Um, so I'm a big fan of workshopping. I workshop everything I write. Um, and uh, and I, I think it's really important to get you over those dark moments. Having your readers there is really important. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Does your main character ever surprise you? Oh, yeah. Sure, things come out of her mouth I weren't, wasn't expecting and uh, <laughs> um, Poppy turned out to be a little more edgy, I think, than I thought she would be. Um, and, uh, yeah, no other time. Characters are always surprising you. And if they are, I think that's a great sign. It means the book's alive in your head and, um, and, and they have their own way of doing things, which you, I think what that means is that uh, your unconscious mind has been working on that character without you realising it. Um, and, and as I said before, it always knows best. How many drafts do you do before handing it in? Usually three, four, something like that. Depends on the time frame. Um, with this one more, because it was the first you know, my first uh, try at crime. And so I wanted to have it really polished before I, and, and normally I have a contract, you know, so normally um, normally they know they're not getting the, the, the kind of polished level that you would bring a, a, a non-spec book to before you submit it. Uh, and they like that. They prefer to have input, you know, once you've got a contract, they prefer to have input fairly early. So that's fine. Um, for a book that I was submitting um, without a contract, you know, just trying to get it accepted, uh, I would I would do probably five or six drafts, maybe up to eight. Okay. Do you start with plot or character or something else? Um, well, in this case, I started with a setting, which was the little house. Uh, and something that had actually happened, which was that we found bones under the floorboards. Mm. Um, I, I guess I typically start with a character in a situation. So it's the two things coming together that make the story. Um, and, and I guess, you know, one of the good things about writing this kind of of book is that I have Poppy, you know, from now on Poppy is my girl. Mm -hmm. And and so she's always there and therefore for each book it'll be plot and situation, you know, um, given that I already have her. Uh, and the real trick with that kind of series, I think, is um, to avoid the Jessica Fletcher effect where, you know, if, if murder she wrote, everywhere she goes, someone dies. <laughs> and, and when you have a non-professional a character as your main character in a in a series you that's a real issue it seems to me um but I have a plan I have a plan for that <laughs> who are your writing inspirations oh gosh um at the moment I'm just blown away by Anita Heiss's latest book mm. um uh, I don't know if you have read it yeah. 
uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce it. I can pronounce it if I've got it in front of me. Um, River of Dreams is the is the translation from the Wiradjuri word. Um, I and why the reason I find Anita so inspiring is um, when I look at her journey as a writer, where every book she's written has been better than the last, mm. and this one is extraordinary. Um, uh, Billy Yarra Dang, no, Galangdere, I think is how you say it, but um, but it's just an extraordinary book. And um, the way that, you know, it's, it's very tightly plotted, although it doesn't appear to be at first. And uh, the characters are just fantastic. So, yeah, at the moment, what I'm inspired by with Anita is, um, is just the way she's, she keeps pushing herself, just keeps pushing herself with every book. Um, in crime, crime's harder. Um, I'm, I guess I'm inspired by Candace Fox's kind of the way she's just so, um, she, she risks so much with her books, you know, really big ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really admire that. Terrific. What's the best way to dig yourself out of a bad plot hole? Throw it away. <laughs> Oh, that's so cruel. <laughs> uh, um, no, really, I throw it away. I mean, I, I feel like if you've dug yourself into a plot hole, you need to get out of the hole before you can see a solution to it. And so I, I would say, okay, what is this doing to my character? What is this plot doing, bit plot doing to my character? And if it's not doing enough, then you don't need it. You need something else instead. And I think this applies not only to plot holes, but also to everything. Like if you find yourself going over and over a scene, trying to get it right, no matter what you do, you can't get it right, throw it away. Don't have that scene. Have a different scene. Um, and, yeah, that's what I mean about the radical editing approach. It's like, do I need this plot? Maybe not. Maybe I can do something different. And just play. Just play with it for a while. Um, and have some fun, I think, is the, yeah. And our final question for today, how would you get away with murder? I have thought about this quite a lot. <laughs> uh, because I actually have a story in mind, not a poppy story, but a different story where someone does get away with murder. But clearly I can't tell you about that. <laughs> no. Um, because obviously it would be revealing my my the spoilers of, for the, this new series. So um, I can't tell you. Um, but it's all, it all goes back to disposal of the body in the end. It's easy to kill someone. The really hard part is to get rid of the body. Fantastic um, hint. <laughs> oh, fantastic <laughs> tip. Thank you very much. And thanks for being with us today, Pamela. It was a pleasure. Oh, it's been my pleasure, Karina. Thank you.